So Stuart, thank you for joining us. First of all, I'd like you to give us your assessment of the season just gone, please. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, th I think it's been a difficult season. I think there's been um, obviously some wins in there and, and some successes. And, and in my role, you can't just look at the negative part of it, which is ultimately we failed on our objective, which was to get promoted. So absolutely top and center of our objective promotion. That didn't happen. Um, so, so ultimately, we have to say that the season was a failure. Um, but then we also have to look at the, some successes within that, you know. And, and I think of you know Gabriel Sara and how he's ended up settling in and, and done, and our, one of our first players ever direct from South America, which is, you know, that's sort of four years work in the making. So, you know, we can't ignore the success of that or the promotion of Liam Gibbs, uh, you know, another debut in terms of Abu Kamara. So. There's been some successes within it, uh, but ultimately, you know, not good enough, and, and we need to um, we need to move on from it. Firstly, because I think that's important. That you know, it's like a scab; you can't keep picking at it. You eventually, you've got to leave it alone, and you know, you've got to take the learning from this year and come back. And I think also, we have to internally look at and go up until the 45th game of the season, out of 46, we were still in the race to be promoted. It's not like it was over for us at Christmas. So you know, we spent over 150 days in the top six, Coventry spent 19, you know, and fair play, they did it when it mattered and, and respect for, for Mark and the guys there because it's incredible and, and brilliant for them. But also we can't then look at it as we're so far off, we need to close a club, we need to, you know, blow the place up and start again. It's like, well, no, actually, you know, yes, we need to be better. Yes, we need to look at some of the reasons why, yes, we have to hold our hands up. And, you know, that's why, you know, I've been doing the media um, this week is is to show accountability and, and no one's hiding at this football club because we don't um, but also then we got to take the learnings take the good things take the not so good things and, and make sure we come back better yeah in those early learnings early reflections can you put your finger on why perhaps we didn't achieve that objective of promotion yeah i think some were uncontrollable so for example i think you know when we had kieran dowell kenny mclean grant hanley ben gibson all get injured in quick succession that would hurt any team. Four senior players like that um, would hurt any team in the world if they lost four of their most senior players. You know, Man City could lose them before the Champions League final and it would hurt them badly. So that we can't control. Um, you know, people go on, it's an excuse or whatever. It's like, well, that, that's something genuine. And that's, they weren't injuries through poor practice from us or players not being conditioned right. They were genuinely unfortunate injuries. Maybe Ben Gibson hamstring is one we, we, we you know, where we have reviewed as to, to what went wrong there but the other three were completely innocuous nothing to do with sort of anyone other than in the game um, but then I think there's other ones I think we uh, psychologically got affected early uh, on once maybe automatic promotion wasn't there we felt probably internally that we'd failed and David did his utmost to keep reminding people that we can still go up via the playoffs and to be honest you could argue that's a better way to go up in terms of the day out and you definitely get more money as a club for the playoffs, etc. So, but we didn't control that internally. I don't think well enough that narrative around around that, and that's something we need to we need to learn from. We need to bring in whether it's player recruitment, staff recruitment, characters who can help us sort of deal with that a little bit better. Yeah, you said there we were in the mix probably you know up until the 45th game, but do you think there was just a feeling that the season's gotten away from us? Did you personally feel this season is getting away from us? And perhaps did that creep into the playing squad before it should have? Um, I, I don't know. I never felt it. You know, I was still hopeful at 44 minutes at West Brom away. Um, that I'm thinking we win here tonight. This is proper game on and we can still get into the playoffs and, and make a run for it. But I'm, I'm always optimistic about everything in life. You know, so it's, you know, that's how, that's how my mind works. I think in terms of the players, I think, you know, we've, we've got a young group. Um, and towards the end of the season, it was it was probably hard for them, um, and I think a lot of them would have learned a lot, sort of through that sort of period. So, uh, did it seep into them? I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think not, but reality probably yeah, to a certain degree, because you know there was probably a narrative set around us that with ten games ago we had almost failed, and and you know we didn't control that, we didn't take a grip of it well enough, and when we have to learn from that, and we can't let that happen, we got to be mentally stronger to deal with that. Uh, as a collective and also individually, individuals within that. Ultimately, do you think that this squad should have achieved more than they did? Yeah, absolutely. We didn't get enough out of them. Our lads didn't get enough out of themselves. You know, everyone has to take responsibility here 
ultimately we, we didn't achieve and we should have been achieved. I'm not necessarily automatic because you know we've been very fortunate. We've won the league two times in the last whatever three four years, and we know how hard that is. You know, so I think sometimes it gets a bit bandished around. Well, oh, that you know, as if it's easy. It's like wow, winning the league is incredibly hard to do. Getting automatic promoted is incredibly hard to do. It's why I think in our club, in our history, you know, in the top two divisions, we've won seven trophies. Two of them have come in the last, you know, five years. So it's it's incredibly hard to do. But certainly, we should have been as a worst case in the top six, and um, that pains me gratefully. But because it's you know, it could have, would have, should have. But what we have to do, draw a line line under that, and we have to bounce back and. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And if we have a squad that is capable, that we go and achieve our objective. So in, in recent weeks, as it became clear that probably that objective was getting away from us, you know, one win in the last 11, I think it, it was, some sections of the fans, uh, of the supporters have been voicing their frustration in recent weeks. First of all, you know, d have you heard it whilst at the game? And how does that affect you? Yeah, absolutely. We've heard it. Um, or I've heard it. Um, it doesn't affect me. Um, because it doesn't, you know, it, it's likewise when people are singing my name, you know, when we win a league, it's like, thank you, that's, that's nice, but I don't do it for that. I don't, I don't do my job for that. What affects me is the staff I work with. It affects probably my family a lot more and it definitely affects the staff and players a lot more because there's a sense of, you know, I think some of them probably felt that they, you know, maybe let me down and as much as I can reassure them, it's not about that. That's, they're humans and they see me as a human and it's not nice. I think I draw the line at when it's abusive. I accept criticism. <laughs> criticism, not a problem. That's part. If you can't accept criticism, you need to definitely do something else in, in your life. Um, but no one should have to put up with some of the abuse that, that I've had. Um, and that shouldn't be okay. And we shouldn't be normalizing that. That's not okay to be abused. When I've done nothing personally to any of these individuals who are abusing me. Um, so criticism, absolutely take it. Absolutely understand it. Um, and our fans have got their right, you know, they turn up in the numbers, we've sold out season tickets again, you know, it's one of Delia Michael's proudest things is they picked up this club where it's 12,000 fans, it's now sold out every game, you know, unfortunately for our fans travelling around the country, every away game is a, is a trek, right, and that's no one's fault, it's just where we are based in the country, um, and they're incredible and they're absolutely right to be frustrated because what we served up, uh, especially at home at the end of last season, definitely wasn't good enough. So they deserve to be frustrated and disappointed. I think all I would ask of that is keep aiming at me. That's I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Um, not the abuse bit, but the, but the criticism, absolutely. But get behind the team and players because you know I think what we had la at the end of the last season, we had a very young team going out there and they actually needed some help. They needed some support, and you know the way we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. And I think. Everyone wants the same, whether you're a supporter, an employee at the club, a board member at the club, a player at the club. We want to be successful. We all want to enjoy coming to Cairo. This should be a place where all your other worries in life should go away for that two hours. You should come here and not be lonely. You should come here and you know you can forget about what a bad week you've had at work or you've lost your job or you've got someone ill at home. There's more chance of us being successful if we're all in it together. Now that starts with us. We have to produce a team that the fans can be proud of. We have to produce performances because what I don't want is what I've seen the last few home games is children leaving the game early with a mum because they don't want to be around this toxic, toxic atmosphere. I'm at the school gate and they're like, oh, I didn't take my son the weekend because he didn't really enjoy it. That's going to affect our next generation of fans and we can't have that. So by all means be frustrated, but some of the abuse that has been coming out of, of so-called grown men's mouths is like, come on. That's not helpful. Uh, but like I say, that's for us to change. We own that. We have to change it. Um, but meet us halfway or else we definitely can't success. If, if, if whatever we do isn't good enough, then, well, we're going to enter a vicious cycle, which isn't healthy for anyone. So how does the club go about uh, bringing people around who are feeling frustrated? What, what are the steps now? It's all about performance. You know, it, football, one good thing about football is actually quite simple. Perform and win and people get behind it, even when the club is maybe in absolute shambles behind the scenes, because we've all seen it at clubs, and it's like, yeah, but we're winning, we can ignore that. Um, and likewise, when you've got a, a magnificently run football club and they don't achieve on the pitch, it's like, well, we don't care about you being magnificently run, we've just been relegated or we've had a, we've had a poor defeat. So it always comes back to, to what happens on the pitch. But, you know, I, I take a little bit of inspiration from, for example, Arsenal. You know, if you watch how the stick that Mikel Arteta was getting and then players were getting, only 18 months ago to what they created this year where they've had a super successful season, but they stuck together. 
internally they were like no we've we've got to show the character we've got to stick through this yeah we've got to make some tweaks but they also realized they weren't too far away and it's the same for us we just finished six points off the playoffs not where we wanted to be absolutely but we weren't 40 points off the playoffs or relegated or now going to spend time in league one it's like well, no we've had a disappointing season for sure but let's remember the context and let's remember internally that we don't just rip everything up but it's about bringing in hopefully some players that help the current group because we've got a very young squad and hopefully then fans can get behind that and go okay there's there's new hope here and uh you know but what i would say and i think it's important we listen to the fans of course we do and we hear their uh frustrations but i promise you not one of them is more frustrated than me as an individual our board our players our staff not one of them because this is our lives we dedicate our lives to doing the best we can for the football club um, and it's impossible for one person to feel more than than us guys I've heard some of those supporters, perhaps even the media, have asked as well. We need to know now what is the plan. Is it possible for you to to outline, you know, even at a high level, the plan of how you turn around what was obviously a disappointing season? I mean, the, the plan for us has never changed. That's to build infrastructure of a club which is of Premier League standard. So we're close to completing that plan in terms of the training ground. You know, the, the new recovery centre will be open in uh, October, November. Uh, which will make us a training ground which is probably in the top six in the country at that point, a genuinely world-class training centre. The plan is to, um, and always has been, in keep improving academy productivity. Our academy productivity has been 24% of our minutes played in the last six years come from academy products. That is incredibly high. No one else will match that uh, to us. Whilst having success, we won two leagues in that time as well. We played twice in the Premier League. So that's not doing it mid-table in League One where no one really cares. It's like, no, it's doing it while under, under pressure. Ultimately, the plan is to, to strive in the, and thrive in the Premier League. That's, that's never changed. That's what we're working towards every single day. But we're doing it within parameters which are maybe different to, to our competitors. If you look at the amount of outside investment into football clubs, whether that's ownership or debt, it's huge. It's huge. You know, Brighton's owners put 700 million in to get where they are today. Uh, Brentford's 150 million just the last few years up to the recent accounts. These are expensive things to do to establish in the Premier League. Um, so we have to find our own way of doing that, whether that's keeping improving our recruitment system. You know, we're now in South America, you know, which six years ago, if I would have said to the club, oh, we're going to sign a player from South America, they would have laughed. You know, the academy productivity is off, is, is off the charts. The fan base off the chart, you still can't get a ticket here. You know, so there's so many things going our way. Look at the work that CSF have done. We created the Nest, you know, where it's like we've got a community which is as big as anything else in the country. You know, so this football club, on the outside, when within the industry, is put up on a pedestal as how to run a club, how to do it. We've probably got caught up internally of creating massive expectations. And I said to the players and staff last week before they went away, I said, don't forget, you've created this. You've created this expectation by being successful which is brilliant because five years ago, no one cared. It was like, mm, we'll finish whatever in the championship. We've now created it. We're actually having a season like we have is deemed as a disaster. That's because we've created that expectation. And I said to the players, congratulations, because that's a shift for our football club. where We've now gone being little old Norwich to be seen as Premier League infrastructure, Premier League club, Premier League club in waiting, they're ready to take off. Brilliant, I said, because that's been created from the people in, when I spoke in that particular room. You've spoken there a little bit about the finances and the reality of that. Can you explain the financial ability of the club to go after the players you perhaps need to bring in to refresh the squad for next season? It's challenging for sure. You know, we need to be creative within the transfer market. I'm not sat here with millions to spend, but never have been. You know, um, so we need to be creative around you know loan markets, uh, free transfer markets, some smart opportunistic buys. You know, obviously, if we were to sell a player, that might help give us some more funds, you know, for us. And, you know, we've had big interest in a couple already, so that might happen. Um, but, yeah, it won't be massive sales. But I think at championship level, it doesn't have to be, in terms of massive buys, sorry. It doesn't have to be spend, 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 spend. It's, it's about making the smart decisions, the right decisions. You know, it's looking at the balance of the squad. So, for example, bringing Ashley Barnes in, it's looking at the going, we've got Adam Eder, 22, we've got Josh Sargent, 23, two young strikers, right, We've lost team who's an experienced one. Okay, let's bring in an experienced one, big character. He's played over 200 games in the Premier League, been won this league twice. Okay, great. That means Josh or Adam can play with him as well because, you know, Ashley's got the ability to play in a two and, and play as a little bit more of a deeper, like a type number 10. 
with his experience, what he can bring to them players. You know, we'll do the same in a couple of other positions, bring in some real experience to help a Liam Gibbs, to help an Omar Bomadeli, to help a Johnny Rowe, to help a, I don't know, Christos Solis, to help a Nunez, bringing in some, some real people to help. But then also a couple of exciting younger players. You know, I think there's, there's certain parts of the pitch which are obvious. We need to help. We didn't create enough big chances. If you look at uh, the back end of last season, you know, people could point fingers at our strikers, but they're only as good as what we can create. You know, if you remember with Timo, all his goals, it's, you know, he had Franjic behind him or he had uh, Buendia with him or Matthias Norman with him or whatever. So it, it's, we have to, you know, it's about building that whole sort of team. In, in your early days here, obviously you brought in Daniel, there was probably quite a clear footballing identity and a style of play. Um, is the signing of perhaps Ashley Barnes uh, a deviation? We, we perhaps haven't seen over the last couple of years quite such an obvious style of play on the pitch. Is that a deliberate change or is that perhaps we haven't been able to execute it like we did in the first few years? No, it's a deliberate change because if we look at um, when Daniel left, you know, we'd won six out of 49 Premier League games playing the way we were doing it. And unfortunately, that gets you relegated badly each time. So it was about recognizing the real good work done during that period, but then also, right, how can we, how can we grow on that? And how can we evolve the playing style to give us more chance of achieving our objective, which is staying in the Premier League and thriving in there? Because we've proven we could get there. Uh, it's about proving, right, how do we stay there now and ultimately thrive within it? I wouldn't say Ashley Barnes is a deviation from that because I think, you know, that would be, if you look how Burnley have just played this year, I think everyone would accept us playing like that next season. So, um, but, you know, the, the one of David's super strengths is he's got a clear way of playing. Uh, we need to give him the playing personnel for that. It's a way, I think, you ask any fan who was here that night when Huddersfield, you know, David and I were at Huddersfield that night, played Norwich off the pitch. Um, couldn't a team look like that? I think everyone would sign up for that right now. Um, but also we need a bit more devilment within the team. You know, over the last five years, well, since I've been here, we've given away too many goals. Even when we've been successful, you know, we've, we've had a soft underbelly. Um, and we, it's something, a part of the change when we made it and brought in Dean uh, was to execute that around psychological support, around set pieces and stuff. And, and we've seen lots of that work grow. Have we got the end result of that yet? No, we haven't, but we're on that journey. And, and I think it's, in my role, you have to understand that these things take time. It's a bit like D Daniel's first season. If you would have been here the night we played Burton at home and drew nil-nil on a Tuesday night, I'd question anyone to say that was a great night of football and we can see the plan. I think most people went home scratching their heads going, I don't know what that is. So it's about that some of them we could implement it by bringing in the players to suit Daniel's style. And it's the same this summer with, with David. We've got to bring the players in that really suit that. He's got a full pre-season, which is a huge advantage. You know, last season's pre-season was small because Premier League finished later, Championship early, you know, international players away. This one, a lot different. The minimum we've got is five weeks with players on pre-season. Most we've got six, just a few internationals are a little bit later. We'll do our business early as best we can, certainly three or four. I would expect to be in before, um, before first day of pre-season or by the time the internationals come back. So it gives us a chance of really building in pre-season to lead into the season with, you know, with a level of enthusiasm. And as I said to David and the staff last week, when you know, part of the review stuff we were doing it, some of the non-negotiables are, we've got to be the fittest team in the league because we're fully in control of that. That's not down to how good a player is or how bad a player is. That's, that's our gift to sort of give ourselves. Being the most organized, that's, that's our gift. Not giving away sloppy goals, that's our gift improving the psychology around our team. That's our gift by working around that. So I think it's um, a real emphasis and pressure, in a good way, pressure on our staff and players that I can be the human shield at the minute and, and take the criticism, that's fine. But after me, it'll be the next person, right? So it, it, it's sort of, you know, um, we've got to make sure that everyone's, you know, fully, you know, together on what we need to achieve and how we need to achieve it. So how confident are you that you can strengthen the squad sufficiently for a promotion challenge and where are you in that process? Yeah, I mean, super confident. I think, um, you know, a saying which I like a lot is success leaves clues. And, you know, I've been very fortunate in my life of being part of building three promotion winning teams out of this league at Huddersfield at once and obviously twice here. So knowing what that takes is, is I think, a real big advantage. Um, I think, if anything, the last positive of the last 11 games was it helped really make some decisions up because sometimes at the end of the season you can get kidded you know when the pressure's off in games you know someone goes and scores six goals you know oh, we have to keep them it's like, oh, you know or, or whatever so I think that helps in being super crystal clear on right we know what we need to do um, you know and let's get on with it and I think the, the second part of the question 
you know, we've already started that with Ashley Barnes. I'm super confident in the next week we'll be announcing our second new signing. I'm super confident that we'll be announcing a new staff member very soon to join the coaching team. So we're working 100 miles an hour um, to give ourselves the best chance to start next year. Then it's about the quality of our work, obviously a little bit of luck along the way that we need in sport. But yeah, I'm, I sit here super confident and not in an arrogant way, but in a way that we've got a group of players, a group of staff, and a group of supporters who actually know what it takes to get out of this league and what we need to do. And now it's a case of, well, let's deliver on our bit. And then hopefully we can all come together and, you know, we can have a super exciting next season. And if that ends in promotion at the end, brilliant. We'll look back at this season and go, you know what, that was a great learning for us. If it doesn't, we'll dust ourselves off. But I think what is super important for our staff and players, I told them last week and, and, and the supporters can hear it now if, if they're watching this, is our aim is to get promoted next year. Harder, because you've got three big teams coming down from the Premier League with lots of resource, but also we know the pressure which comes with that, because we've just lived with that pressure of, oh, you're going to get all smash promoted. They, all three of them have now got that. But luckily, there's six places available to, to get in that race for promotion. Ultimately, three only do it. But, you know, so that's what we want to be. That's where we want to be. And that's all our energy is towards that. There's no other thought other than build a team that can give us the best chance of promotion next season. And when you're building that team, you're obviously working within the parameters of the club's model. Do you think the model can consistently take us to the next level, you know, in, in the pecking order of football? And do you, in fact, ever see our model changing? Uh, no, I think the model will change for sure in time because I, I think ultimately it'll have to change because if we look at the, the movement of finances within football in the last 20 years, it's absolutely... You know, I mean, look at Wrexham, right? Wrexham, cl club close to my heart, first club I worked for. You know, they lost three million last year to try and get out of the National League. Three million pounds. That's like, wow, to get out of to get out of that league. And that's a crowd who have their stadium full every week. They've got massive sponsorship and stuff so like that. So the financial climate of football has changed considerably. I think Leicester's owner has just written off another 120 million. It's massive money now, you know, and, and the fact is our record signing is still Tim Closer. You know, and if we look at clubs can go and spend 20, 30 million pounds now on a punt. You know, we're still maybe £500,000 on a punt. So I think ultimately for the club to thrive at the highest level of the game, which is where we all want to be, absolutely, whether that's working or as a supporter, ultimately that will have to change because doing it the way we've been doing it has proven for the last 30 years that that's actually not possible. You know, there's been lots of people trying to do it. But what we have to do is, during that period, until that time maybe comes, because it might not come, because not everyone wants to come and blow their money at a football club, is it's about building the foundation to make sure that we're ready to go at that point. Um, and that's what we can do. And it's about being that, right, if we get to the Premier League, you know, maybe the next time the club's in the Premier League, there is greater resource available to maybe take a few more calculated risks where you're not making that decision based on if this goes wrong, we are bust. Because that's been the reality of, of, of running this football club uh, or part of running this football club since I've been here is we make too many bad decisions. The end result isn't just someone getting sacked or a bad season. The end result is the club's in administration and isn't paying its players and staff. So maybe the next time that opportunity comes with how the board is growing now and stuff like this, which is stuff way above my level, but... Hopefully that's going to lead to more help. Mark's already been a fantastic help and, and his group in, in supporting us both financially and, and professionally already to, to help sort of close that gap. But, you know, it, it's going to be a big gap to close and the gap's only getting bigger. You know, the gap's not getting smaller. You know, look at the amount of foreign investment into the Premier League now. You know, these, you know, Southampton spent 143 million net this year and at the minute have got three more points than what we got last year. That's how hard it is. And that's not against their work because... You look on the face of it and go, some of the work's outstanding. But outstanding still isn't quite good enough at, at, at that level for, for some teams. So I think it's, it's super hard. But what we have to keep doing is keep working towards that whilst never losing what is important, which is a club at the heart of the community. And I think one thing I believe this club is special for is you can come to a game here and you can see a granddad, a daughter, a son, a grandson, all at the same game and them generations, and, that, and that's, that's quite rare. You can go up to Cromer 40 minutes away 
I'm bumping to Norwich fans who want to talk about the club or the time they met Delia or where's Houlihan was their favourite player or why did you sell Emi Buendia? And it's amazing, you know, and I, I think one thing we can't do is lose that because I think you've got to be careful of what you wish for as well is, you know, we've got owners who love the club, who are fans, they genuinely care uh, and they've given their life to here. Be careful what you wish for as well because on the face of it you could have someone who you think is amazing but you never see them, they're not public facing, you don't get any accounting decisions, you know, they, they own the club outright, there is no AGM, so there's a chance for someone to ask why, you know, why are the pies too cold or too hot? You know, this is a club which we care about our, our fan base. Um, we invest in our fan base, we invest in our community we, with both time and resource. And I think that's what makes football special and that's how it should be and this club will be here forever. So we just gotta make sure that the grass isn't always greener. You hear the success stories of Man City, absolutely, wow, what a success. But you've also seen what happened to a Leeds going down to League One and, and you know, horrific situation there, Nottingham Forest, Ipswich, you know, what a club Ipswich is and the proud tradition and you know, they look like they're getting it right now, which is which is great for them, but they you know, they've had a real difficult time, you know, and, and that's the reality. And no one could say, Oh, we're a bigger club than them. Like, I think Ipswich would put their trophies on the table and, and argue back. Um so I think it's yeah, just being super mindful of not being caught up in being a twelve year old in terms of your, oh, we should just sign Mbappe. Come on, let, let's, let's, let's be realistic and let's remember what the club is here for. So we know we're not going to take short-term risks just to achieve you know, quick wins, but what is the long-term? What, how long is long-term where you would say, okay, I expect the club to make a step change in its pecking order? Would you put a time scale on that? No, because I don't think I can. I think that's, that's above me. I think that's, that's a question at board level and, and I'm, I don't sit at that level I think it's um, you know but what I would say is this board is ambitious but it's also realistic and super experienced. Just take Mark Atanosio he's owned a sports franchise in the US for 18 years and has built it step by step. I might be wrong here and I don't want to talk for him but I don't think he's a guy who's going to turn up and just write a load of checks and buy a load of bad players and not worry about it. I think he, I don't think he's that guy um, and I don't think that's how his sports clubs should be because then you can just have a short-term success of oh we stayed up for a year or whatever and then you go what happens the next year though because we stopped investing in infrastructure we stopped investing in the academy we stopped investing in the community oh now we're back to where we were but we're actually no stronger as a football club and i, and I think it's you've got to have that strength if you look at Carrow road you know it needs some work now you know the guys who do a great job commercially there's nothing left for them to sell you know Our hospitality is needs to be better but it's tough to do that within the stadium as it currently is. So, you know, we want to grow the fan base. You know, young supporters can't buy tickets because the season tickets sell out every year, which is a massive positive. But also it's super hard for the new fan to be able to come and watch us. You know, and that's why like the cup games have been a great success in recent times. Uh, obviously the women's team has been a great success because these people have to visit what should be deemed as their home and watch a team in, in yellow and green play, which is great. But I think it's, um, in terms of time phrase, I'm not the guy to answer that. What I would say is, I believe, as an employee at the club, that the club's in good hands. It's with people who care. It's with people who are ambitious. But I think it's right to say they're ambitious but experienced to have a, a tinge of reality with it as well and not just come out and say what supporters want to hear or some cheap lines in the media and then they fail to back up them promises and then all of a sudden you then deemed them as a liar and you've lost trust with your fan base. I think it's one of our strengths is, is when we speak, we try and speak from the heart, but we also try and be honest as well as realistic. And that's not always what people want to hear, which again, I fully respect. You know, uh, I like F1. I don't like it when I hear a team principal saying, we're a second off the pace, nothing we can do about it. We haven't got the resources of Ferrari. I'm like, no, I want to turn up thinking that you can win, you know? Um, so I get that that bit, but also, you know, it's not right that we, that we lie to people, or sell people some some, dream which maybe isn't there in the short term. You've talked a little bit about accountability there. What pressure are you under internally to deliver? Because some have raised the question that obviously, you know, you're married to the executive director and therefore might well have a free pass. Is that the case? No, and I think anyone who says that disappoints me greatly because it's interesting when we won the league, everyone said, thank God he's married to someone else who works at the club. It means he'll probably stay. And I'm like, well, I don't think that's going to be the reason to sort of stay. So I think, first of all, it's dispelling the myth of that. Um, so Zoe is here on merit. Zoe was at the football club before me. 
which again, people choose to forget, but she was at the football club before me and then she got pregnant um, and left the football club and it was always, we want you to come back. Time elapsed, Norwich liked the work going on at Huddersfield and, and decided to offer me the job. Um, it suited greatly that there would have been an opportunity for Zoe at that point to come back as well because we're human and we're a family and at that point we were living in Liverpool. She was working within the North West. Probably wouldn't have worked for me to have, well, I wouldn't have come. It's, it's, it's the truth because it's like, well, I'm not going to leave a newborn baby and, and my wife up there um, and come down here because we know it's a, it's a long way away, right? I think also the myth that I report to her. So I report to the board, uh, as, uh, as does Zoe. We both report into the board. There hasn't been, but if there is ever a moment where there's a confliction, it would be, Zoe, can you leave the room? Stuart, can you, can you leave the room? And that's clearly written within our contracts that there is no, there is no conflict. There, is, there can't be a conflict because that's not healthy for the club. In terms of my accountability, I'm accountable to the board. You know, and the board are very clear that we didn't achieve what we set out to achieve last year. But I'll be honest, I don't need anyone to tell me that. You know, I don't, I don't need to sit in a review with Delia, Michael, Mark, Tom and Michael Folger, for example, for them to tell me that the season was disappointing. I'll go to them and go, this is disappointing, these are the reasons why, this is what I didn't do good enough, this is what we need to do better at. Um, so I think, I don't feel under pressure from the board actually, because I actually feel under pressure from myself. If the board at any point choose to get rid of me, that I, would, I fully respect that, they need to do what's right for the football club, that's what a board of directors is for, it's, it's, it's uh, to protect the football club and if there's someone out there that they felt was better than me, um, and they want to get rid of me, I would fully respect that and, and have absolutely no problem with it because I understand that's football and whatever. But what I would say is there's not one bit of pressure that they could put on me which is any more that I'd ever put on myself. Uh, we have a relationship which is once very honest and transparency. And I think also the board have seen the bigger picture of where this football club in my time has started to where it is today and how we've done that and the value we brought in the football club, even to having someone who joined the board in Mark Atanosio, uh, where the process of that was myself, Zoe, Anthony Richens, working on finding investment for this football club. The minute Michael Folger said to us, I think I might be ready to sell my shares. Okay, well, do you want some help with that? Yes, please. Okay, we can help you. Let's meet people, let, let's try and do it. And it was a, a, a work of a year of which Anthony Richens did the real bulk of that work and then Zoe and I were there to help him in terms of the interviewing process of people because Michael Folger, and this says everything about the man, wanted the club to go to the right person more than the right money. You know, for him it wasn't about, well, oh, someone gives me an extra X, I'll sell it to them. It was like, no, this has to be someone who fits in with the club, who wants to be part of the bigger picture, who gets on with Delia and Michael. So, you know, to, to play a part in that. Um, so I think the board are probably respectful of this club looks very, very different to what it did when I turned up six years ago. And I think they've respected that I've turned down other opportunities, which would have been much more luxury on a personal level, would have worked at a higher level because I'd always said, no, I'm committed to this project. Um, that commitment will end at some point from my side. It might end from the club point at some time. And that's all right as well. That, that day is coming for sure um, because I've been here six years and that's a long time in my job and, and you know, it's not going to last forever. But yeah, like I said, there's no pressure they can put on me, which is bigger than myself. So how focused and motivated do you still feel for this? Because obviously you've been through a couple of cycles of achieving promotion and coming back down again. Have you still got the same appetite to do whatever it takes to achieve the vision? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think there's still lots of growth for the club as well. The non-exciting stuff, which excites me, you know, I appreciate people turn up for a Saturday afternoon. The job's much bigger than that. You know, people say, oh, I get judged purely on recruitment. It's like, well, this job is much you know, wider than that. And that's why I talk a lot publicly uh, around the job in different forums to local media, more national stuff, because it's like we've got to constantly educate actually what this role is. It's not just signing players. You know, I think people have you know, got to wake up to that. Um, but no, my enthusiasm has never stopped for this job. Uh, I work incredibly hard every day. Um, I've not had a day off in my time at the club. You know, there's always something with my phone. You know, there's always another email. There's always something else. And, and my family have always uh, accepted that and, you know, suffered slightly at times for that. You can be sat on a holiday and, sorry, the next two hours I'm on the phone call. That, that, that's life because actually the club comes first. Can that cause burnout at all? 
Uh, no, I don't think, so. well, I think it can if you allow it to, uh, but I think I've learned over the time the, the, the stuff where I need to take time out. You know, I'm very big on my own mental health in terms of how I look after myself, around my nutrition, around exercise, around having other things in my life that won't ever take me fully away from work, but okay, for that day, I'm actually thinking about something else and I can pick up the work when I get home that night. But yeah, of course, uh, there comes a day when you know, I'll want a new challenge somewhere else or the club will want someone new to drive this project forward. And that's OK. I think uh, as long as and it will end in a happy way where people respect what I've done for the club, I respect what the club have done for me. And that'll be the case. And that's where, you know, the relationship with Delia and Michael and now Mark and Tom on the board, Michael Folger before he went, Stefan Phillips, you know, some, I've been fortunate there have been some great people is one where they see the sacrifices they see that I'm a human shield for this football club at times you know you never hear people come out and criticize any other club as a reason for that let me take it I'll be that guy let me take it I'll take that from you because somebody needs to and, and I like protecting people in that way um, and I think that brings an element of respect because lots of people in my job uh, lots of clubs all around uh, the country don't ever talk and they can hide away and be faceless and let it all be on the manager or let it all be on the chief exec or let it all be on an owner. Um, I don't believe in that. I believe in protecting the people that I work with and the people I work for. And um, I'm sure when it ends, yeah, it'll end in a nice way. And, you know, this is a club, you know, I will live, I think, in the round Norfolk for life. It's my home. It's my son's home. And, you know, I want to be able to come back here in 20 years, a thriving Premier League club and enjoy watching football with my family and remember how special this place is to me and to, to my family and I refuse to let whatever happens that be ruined because I always want to be able to walk in through the front door here um, and be welcomed back um, and enjoy it and watch the club grow because I think the foundation we've built is super exciting so I believe that you know when that day does come I, one thing I can guarantee if I leave tomorrow or I leave next year or I leave in five years, 100% of the club's in a better shape than when I found it, 100%. And that's what I said in my very first interview. That's part of this job and, and I take great pride in that. And, um, but also excited to see when the time does come, what happens next? Um, because the foundation's there for someone, bang, they can take it on the next level, you know, which would be brilliant. So looking ahead to next season, can the 20,000 plus season ticket holders return to Carroll Road next season with a genuine hope that we might have some similar memories to some of those we've experienced in recent seasons? Yeah, absolutely. And I think all I would ask for that is give the team time though as well. You know, let's not make our mind up after the first 20 minutes of the first game of, oh, same old rubbish and pessimism. It's got to be, give us a chance. You know, we've got to rebuild confidence. We've got to rebuild the way we want to play. There's, there's lots, and there's going to be days where that doesn't work. There's going to be days where we don't perform. Maybe the opposition are better us because that's allowed in sport as well. But absolutely, you know, and hopefully over this summer period, new signings, new kit, other club news, people will come and go, oh, okay, that's, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Then it's on us. We have to, all I'll say is turn up with hope. And if we disappoint you, fine but turn up with that and then we've got to be the ones who let you continue to, to follow that hope and follow them dreams. And let's be honest, football, you know, even this year, Birmingham away, we scored in the last minute. Tell me a better feeling in the world than that. You know, that feeling for our 1,500 fans we had there that night, you know, I think we've gone second in the league or whatever. I don't care who you are, that feeling is unbelievable. And let's work our way towards getting as many as in we can. But then it also accept the day when we play great and we lose 1-0. You know, I remember a game here a few years ago, we lost at home 1-0 to Stoke. I think it was the first promotion year. They had one shot, I think it's deflected off Tim Closer and went in and we got a stand and ovation. Because I think the fans appreciated, no, you know what, this team's doing all right for us. We've still got to stick with them and they're the moments we've got to hopefully build back to where, because you're going to have a bad day in the championship. You're going to have lots of bad days. You're probably going to lose somewhere between seven and 10 games in a successful season. That's a lot of defeats. That's their moments where, and I said the same to the local media, don't kill us at that point. Give us a chance. Um, and then it's for us to deliver on that. Well, Stuart, thank you for joining us and good luck with the coming season. Appreciate it. Thank you.